Good morning and thank you for attending today's Crane Safety Webinar presentation. My name is Katie Parrish, editor of Crane Hotline and your host for today's conference. If you have follow-up questions, comments, ideas, or suggestions after today's event or for future webinars, please feel free to contact me at the phone number and email address at the end of this presentation. Crane Hotline would like to extend a special thank you to today's sponsor, CM Labs. CM Labs builds simulation-based solutions to help clients design advanced equipment and prepare for skilled operations. With CM Labs' Vortex software platform, clients are able to experience their product vision before it's a reality and train crews for safe and efficient operations before stepping foot on the real job site. Today, CM Labs is the leading vendor for simulation-based training in the construction industry. With more than 1,000 simulators in 30 countries using Vortex software, it has become the de facto standard for the industry. For two years in a row, CM Labs was named to the prestigious Deloitte Technology Fast 500, and it is among the fastest growing technology companies in North America. The company's markets are global, working with established leaders as well as emerging market trailblazers. A few of its prestigious customers include Honda, Hitachi, John Deere, Liebherr, and Volvo. For more information, visit cm-labs.com. In today's webinar, How to Build Safer Crane Operators with Simulation-Based Training, you'll learn why some leading organizations are using simulators to reinforce the connection between operators and the operating environment while others are using them to keep their operator skills sharp. With simulators, these companies are getting proven results, including faster time to competency, skilled and safe operators, and effective objective operator assessment. Today's presenters are Justin Weber and Carl Johnson. Justin Weber is the Industry Solutions Manager for CM Labs. He has more than 10 years of experience providing high-tech solutions to the industry. With the CM Labs team, he advises on simulation-based solutions that help clients design advanced equipment and prepare for skilled operations. Carl Johnson is president of Gulf Coast Heavy Equipment Training and Services. With more than 25 years of experience, he is an international leader within the mobile and hoisting and rigging industry. He is active in ASME and NCCCO and holds CCO certifications and endorsements. At the end of the webinar, we will hold a question and answer session. If you have questions for our presenters, please type them into the chat box or the question box on your screen anytime during the presentation. Additionally, this presentation is being recorded and can be accessed next week on cranehotline.com. All right, before Justin jumps into his portion of the webinar, I'm going to kick the session off with an interactive poll. We want your opinion on the following question. What objections do you see around using simulation-based training in your organization? Please answer. I'll give you about 15 seconds, 20 seconds, and Justin is going to give us his thoughts on these answers from the audience. Okay, we've got a majority voted here. Justin, why don't you go ahead and uh, give us some response on what you uh, what some of these answers are? Yeah, well, thank you very much, and it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, to be quite honest, I think all of these four are very relevant objections that lots of organizations have to simulators. So I, I'd like to touch on them uh, all briefly. I mean, the cost is too high. This is something that 
you know, if you if you know the flight industry and you know the type of simulators they sell there, the price points are very high. But the truth is, with new technology and new approaches to building simulators today, there are simulators that fit all budgets, something ranging from a desktop simulator to something that's really fully immersive with the full replication of the cabin and the operating environment of, uh, of that student as well. So there's lots of cost saving approaches that can be taken to find a solution that's right for the budget. Um, another thing I'd like to address is it's difficult to integrate into training programs, and this is absolutely true. What, what needs to be understood is that there's no one size fits all. Um, we often say that simulators are designed to sit somewhere between the classroom and the real equipment, but in no way they're replacing all the training that you're doing today on your equipment. They're a complement, and there's many areas that simulators excel which are very difficult to replicate in the field. So you really have to look at how you're training today, what your training issues are, and what your objective are, and find the type of partner that can get you there and really help you figure out where that middle ground is. And uh, Carl, if you would, you know, I think it would be great if you uh, told us a little bit about your experience, um, the perception of operators or trainers not accepting simulation technology, and also it not being realistic enough since you've tried it uh, yourself. Really, I haven't had that big of an issue with operators or trainers accepting the challenge, uh, the, the technology, because they're very receptive to it as a way to, to better hone our skills uh, for in the future, especially brand new apprentices uh, that have never been exposed to a crane. It gives them a chance to get in and get a virtual feel of what can actually be happening to them in the field. And as far as not being very realistic, uh, the sims that I've dealt with are very realistic with motion platforms being very immersive uh, to where you can feel everything that's going on with whatever the situation is or scenario that you're broadcasting on the, on the sim. Yeah, I think those are great points, and, and you know, I'd also add, uh, I, I'm from the gaming generation. I grew up with video games, and, and I know that people of my age and younger were very receptive to simulator technology. It's something that we grew up with, we feel comfortable with. It's a kind of learning tool that is exciting for us. We want to sit down, we want to try it out, and uh, we get to try things firsthand without the stress of being on the, the machine and having our, our colleagues look at us and, and judge our first performance. So uh, those were all really relevant points. Thanks, Carl. Welcome. Great. Thank you. Thank you guys for your comments there and your all participation in the poll. Uh, I'm going to pass the controls over to Justin and he's going to get started on his webinar presentation. Thank you, Katie. this here. Hide. <laughs> okay, and we should now be seeing the slide. Katie, you can confirm that? Perfect, yes. Perfect. Okay, great. Well, um, tell you a little bit about who we are. You know, this presentation today is really to focus on how crane simulators uh, can help build really experienced and safe operators, and kind of to dispel some of the myths about what people perceive about simulation. So most of you are probably familiar with um, simulation-based training and simulators for training, but perhaps there are some doubts about how effective they can be. And I'd like to kick off the webinar by debunking a few of the common myths that we see uh, around simulator-based training today. So my name is uh, Justin Weber, as uh, Katie introduced us before, and my specific industry is actually the defense industry. And you might think, yeah, that's really different from cranes, or that, that's really different from heavy equipment, but the reality is it's not different at all. Uh, they have the same types of issues. The cost of training, the ability to make safer operators, the uh, return on investment of their purchases, uh, also the complexity of the equipment, and the reality is uh, whether it's the Army or Navy, they're using a lot of similar equipment. The uh, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is using cranes and earth-moving equipment. Uh, uh, the Navy is using all sorts of crane ha uh, container handling and logistics equipment, so there's a lot of commonality that's there. So just a brief slide about who we are at CM Labs. Um, we were established in 1996. Really, our focus is everything around 
from ground vehicles, heavy equipment, and subsea and top sea equipment. So anything that has complex mechanisms, interactions with dynamic environments, where the realism of the equipment is really important to get the right training outcomes. Uh, we're based in Montreal, Canada, and we're ISO certified, so we have very strict processes on how we develop and deliver our products. Now, we work in multiple industries, uh, the first of those being the construction industry. Uh, the types of products we have here are all off-the-shelf training modules for lifting and earth-moving equipment, and we also build customizations for clients as well. That could be anything from a new crane to a different environment or specific scenarios that are resolving very uh, pointed training issues that the client has. Another industry that we uh, participate in is the port industry, where we build primarily custom training solutions. And the reason for that is port operators have uh, the desire and the need to really train in their own operating environment. They want to see their own client terminal. They want to have their own equipment. Because one of the issues for them is they just don't have that much equipment to train on. So they need to rely on simulators to fill that gap and actually get the hours to certify new operators, but also recertify existing staff as well. And the defense industry, which I work in, which kind of encompasses everything that uh, we do in construction ports, but also includes things like armored uh, personnel carriers, main battle tanks, all sorts of different uh, road vehicles uh, for the armed forces. And we're really based all over the world. You know, we have lots of simulator installations in all these markets. Uh, we have over a thousand simulators installed worldwide, uh, or that being about 150 clients in over 30 countries. So we not only can deliver these solutions, we can support global clients as well. So let's jump into the top three myths that that I've run into. And the first one is it's just a game. And People who are unfamiliar with technology sometimes refer to sim simulators as just being a game. Um, but today, the reality is we can accurately replicate the real behavior of cranes, heavy equipment, the rigging, the cables, the loads, and the, all the dynamics of those components as well. With this, uh, we can uh, simulators can offer real time, uh, sorry, real world training and provide objective criteria to evaluate operators. And by objective criteria, I mean the simulator uh, records all the data that the student is uh, running in the simulation, and you can have a baseline to look at the proficiency of your operators on a very equal measure. That's very objective. So simulators today are very serious learning tools. Now let's take a well-established example for simulators. The airline industry has been using them for years. And pilots have a really important role. I mean, they, they're taking responsibility not only for the complex and expensive equipment, but also for people's lives. Uh, simulators train pilots for non-typical events, like the failure of the, of the plane, water landings, things that they typically cannot train for on the real equipment. Um, and pilots, on top of that, have specified amounts of time that they need to spend in the simulator in order to be recertified. So it's really an industry that is fully adopted, uh, adopted simulators. The reasons that simulators are good for flight is because these models are verified against instrumented data in the field. What does that mean? The instrument, the plane, they understand how the flight dynamics works, and they're able in the simulation to compare the results of the simulation with that instrumented data to prove that indeed it's replicating that behavior. And any industry, whether it's defense or the construction industry, deserves that same level of quality of simulation. Now, effective crane operator training simulators have to accurately capture the behavior of rigging, uh, the hoisting of cables, uh, the load to the drum, uh, using actual engineering properties. So the right properties of those cables, the right limits, the right uh, forces, the right engine uh, specifications. And the reason for that is that it ensures that they behave appropriately. Um, and by behaving appropriately, things like pendulum swing is accurate, snagging of cables on different objects, collisions with other objects are also calculated as well, and that provides valuable experience to the student in a very safe environment without endangering the equipment, the environment, 
and having or other people's lives. Um, so the advent of these engineer training solutions is really the key reason that simulation is becoming a primary tool for systematically addressing operator competency and due diligence issues. Um, they've reached a new level of realism because technology has kept advancing and there are a lot of tools out there that allow those developers to build very realistic simulations at a cost-effective cost price. Now, today's advanced simulators use something that's referred to as a high-fidelity physics engine. And what is this? Uh, in layman's terms, what this means is that there is a way for that simulation to replicate real-world physics. That means that if a load weighs a certain weight and it surpasses uh, the limits of a crane, you won't be able to lift it. If your outrigger is in properly position and you're lifting a load at the improper angle, you're going to tip that crane over. So there's emergent behavior that comes out of the simulation based on being able to represent the actual physical reality. Um, motion platforms also add a very high level of realism. Um, Often we hear in the crane industry or earth moving industry, you operate the machinery by the seat of your pants. You feel what's going on, whether it's catching the load, whether it's pushing some soil, you can actually feel in your pants. And now simulators have cost effective motion platforms that let you get those motion cues. So you're not only having the visual representation in front of you, the operating environment of the controls as well, you're also getting the tactile feedback and the, the motion feedback that really lets you understand what's happening to that machine. Now, uh, let's take a few other industry examples. Um, I mean, simulators are not only used in equipment operations or in driver training. Um, for one example, and, and this is quotes coming from uh, Chief Learning Officer, Officer Magazine, they go through a few different industries and look at what are the benefits of simulation-based training. Uh, for the medical industry, uh, and this is surgery related, the same le level of proficiency was achieved in 28% less time by the simulation trained group and worked 29% faster. And this is the important part to me, six times fewer surgical errors. I don't know about you, but if I was getting a surgery, I want a doctor to train on a simulator before he even touched me. Now, if you look at equipment maintenance, the same level of proficiency was achieved in 60% less time. The reality is, when you're on the field, issues happen. Equipment is not always all av available. There's components that are broken. You only have a, um, a low student to teacher ratio. So you get a lot of advantage by using the simulators, even in those maintenance uh, applications. And in driver training, one hour of training in the simulator was shown to be the equivalent of three or four hours of training over the road. Uh, and that simulation uh, train group were, had fuel efficiency that was 6.2% uh, higher. Now, all those things are possible because there's a lot of things that you can train on a simulator that are just difficult to represent in the field. So it's no longer just a game. And if you haven't thought about integrating simulators into your training program yet, you're going to be left behind. The second myth is, Simulators are only good for basic skills. Um, in fact, today's advanced simulators allow trainees to experience conditions and operations that just aren't possible to replicate in the field. Um, you know, examples of that could be anything from failures and malfunctions, cable snapping on a crane. You're typically not going to do this in a training exercise on the field because of the cost of doing so, the risk to people's lives and to the equipment. In a simulator, all that is possible and the instructor is in control. Um, and they can also reproduce metrics objectively, once again, and have a real baseline to understand the proficiency of operators over the whole class or over the whole workforce. So let's give some examples here of what simulators uh, can control. Um, you can produce hazardous situations which are difficult on the crane, such as the busy work site, uh, the shifting load center of mass. Let's say you're moving a container and the, the objects inside that container aren't properly attached. You can actually uh, incorporate faults that make that load shift. You can do things like blind lifts or working around power lines, things that are really difficult to train on. Also, 
Uh, when you're training in the field, you're, you're kind of a slave to the weather that you get. Uh, some weather affects your operations, but it does give you good training benefit as well. Inside of a simulator, the instructor has full control over snow, rain, wind direction, even gusts of wind happening at in, in opportune times, moving clouds and cloud coverage that affect the shadows and the way that you perceive the, the depth and the distance from, from different objects, have fog and even alter the time of day to have different projected shadows. So the instructor really has a lot of control over the actual operating and training environment he can present to students. Uh, you can even train things that are really important in my perspective, which is the lift team. You know, uh, the truth is with accident, uh, crane-related accidents, it's not always the operator's fault. It, it shouldn't be put only on him. Accidents often happen with miscommunication from the team, whether it's a signaler, the rigger, the crane operator working together. Simulators give you the ability to train together as well. What that means is you can have a station for a signaler, a rigger, all working together. You can even do complex lifts like a tandem lift where you have two op operators working together. Um, from our client's experience, this is a type of thing that you can't really train for. You kind of get on the field, you need to do a tandem lift, and you basically find the two most experienced operators, and you, you hope for the best. But this is something that can be trained on, and you can mitigate the risk by using a simulator. Now the third myth they're expensive. Um, so considering the potential return on investment a simulator enables, in the end, simulators are not expensive. And let me explain that a little bit further. So when it comes to using a simulator, uh, you not, not only lower the uh, fuel cost and the wear and tear on the equipment itself, um, you also make cranes available to your staff. In some cases, you might be a larger engineering company that do your own internal training. Uh, you want to have those cranes available to your students. Simulators allow that as well. So fuel cost is, is something that's very clear and very obvious, especially in, in the rising and falling fuel market that we have today. But in addition to that, uh, simulators can also free up instructors to focus on other higher value added tasks. Um, and allow them to have a larger student-to-trainer uh, ratio. That means that an instructor can supervise five to ten students that are operating the equipment versus having a one-to-one -one ratio of in-the-field training. So it does give a lot more seat time, seat time to the students, and it does mitigate risk. So in, in addition to the lower training expenses and the reduced accident rates, our clients have also found that they're training faster and they're training better operators that are prepared for various situations with simulators, situations that they couldn't train for. And to give you one example, um, we have a port terminal client that's been using the simulator for about two years now, and uh, their calculated return on investment on that simulator is a two-year time frame, meaning the money they save in equipment operation, in uh, fuel consumption, in maintenance and insurance, over that period of time pays the simulator within two years. And on year three, they're making money back, or they could be putting more money into their safety programs to increase operator proficiency. Now, simulators today are available for any type of budget. You know, what picture we have here is a classroom setting. It's a very low cost and affordable solution, but it still gives you the same behavior of the equipment inside of the simulation. So you can set up a full classroom of these at, uh, at a reasonable price as well. And you can go all the way to a very immersive solution. Sometimes you want to have the exact operator seat and the specific controls of the equipment you're working on. Uh, and this could range anything from a few hundred thousand dollars, depending on what you're trying to accomplish. But there's a wide variety of solutions that can fit a wide variety of price points and a wide variety of um, risk mitigation uh, that, uh, that you're looking at as well. The truth is simulators are playing an increasing role in training and safety across the industry, whether it's for operator training, for skills assessment, and by skills assessment, I can mean a new operator coming in, or verifying at periodic intervals that your operators are up to the level of proficiency you, you expect. Uh, it 
It's also good for new equipment familiarization, uh, new types of cranes that are being onboarded into a larger engineering company, and also for things such as lift visualization and planning. And just to explain that a little bit better, um, uh, I have a client that was doing the assembly of an aircraft carrier. And the way that you assemble an aircraft carrier is you have these large 100 ton or more compartments that are basically shipped to one location, and you have a, a very large gantry crane that is moving those into place. So they knew exactly what the lift plan was, but they needed to practice with their operators, because one accident could be hundreds of thousands of dollars of delays and damages. So in this case, they were able to train the full lift plan from start to finish of that assembly process all on the simulator, identify um, issues with their plan itself, and mitigate those risks before they even happened. So there's a common factor in all these successful applications, and it's really the realism of the simulator. Uh, advances in technology mean that it's truly possible to simulate reality, and the fact is it's crucial for effective use of simulators. Why? Uh, well, operators can uh, transition their skills that they've learned on the simulator directly to the real thing. They're not just learning about which button do I press first, which knob do I, uh, do I turn. They're learning about the actual operation and the muscle memories they're going to need to ret retain when they arrive on the real equipment. And that sense of realism is essential for creating engaging training. It leads to training that sticks it's like going to save you time, save you effort, and bring up your productivity. And that uh, sums up uh, my presentation for today. Great. Thanks, Justin. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and put another poll up on the screen. Give me one second to get back over here. And let's see. All right, so our second poll of the day, hopefully you all can see this. All right, how do you currently assess operator competency? And I'll give you about 30, 45 seconds. And Justin and Carl will go ahead and uh, we'll uh, talk about these results as well. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and put the results up on the screen here. Hopefully you all can see that. Hey, um, Katie, just uh, to chime in here, you know, from uh, it seems it's really heavily geared towards in-house evaluation by trainer and supervisors and industry certification as the proof of competency. Um, when it comes to in-house evaluations, you know, this is really where a professional grade simulator uh, can really complement the existing evaluation approaches with objective measurements and performance indicators, as well as uh, the reports that map out the trainee's progress through time. So in our experience, it really, really complements this approach quite well. Um, and when it comes to the industry certifications as proof of competency, we often see our operators being uh, used uh, not only to uh, simulators not only being used as a training tool, but also as a hiring tool. So it allows the operator to basically verify the habits even before that they hire a new employee. And further than that, um, industry standard tests, whether they're NCCO tests or uh, whatever standards that are followed in different countries, can be incorporated into the simulator itself. So you can actually plan to have your operators run through those exact tests. So there's really a flexibility that that's really lend well to both approaches. And, and Carl, um, what's your opinion on these? I have to agree with you 100%. I mean, the, the thing I have a question with is why are companies not doing competency assessments? That is very critical to verifying that people you're hiring are qualified to do these jobs. And what a better way to do that than using a simulator or, or doing it on the actual equipment. 
simulator, you can do it anytime, any place without having to worry about setting up the equipment. And, you know, that would be a big thing right there. Just being able to verify somebody's competent in a piece of equipment before you even put them on it. That's some great input, Carl. Great. Okay, I'm going to close this poll out and pass the controls over to Carl, and he's going to jump into his presentation next. Can you see You're everything there? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I'll continue on with uh, basically on what Justin has already started. How to build a safer crane operator with simulator-based training. Who we are as a company, Gulf Coast Heavy Equipment is a full-service equipment and training com uh, consulting company based out of Texas City, Texas, just south of Houston, where we perform all forms of uh, heavy equipment training such as forklift, aerial work platform, and we also do uh, preparatory training for uh, the NCCO programs, mobile crane, single person, and rigger. We also offer uh, consulting services such as accident investigations, expert witness testimony, and we'll even come in and help you uh, develop or view existing policies to make sure that they do meet industry standards. And we do also provide uh, personnel for project oversight uh, as well. Safety first is what we really need to look at when we deal with these things. If a lift goes wrong, it's probably not because of the signal person, the rigger, or the site supervisor. The operator has the responsibility of safety to lift of the lift on his shoulders. This is why it is important for both the operator to have both the knowledge and experience to operate safely. Simulators give a trainee or even an existing operator abundance of training, knowledge, and experience. Because you can put them on a piece of equipment that they're not familiar with, develop a program, train them on that piece of equipment before you even put them out there in the field. Or you can train them on situations uh, that are very critical in very critical placed areas such as in refineries or chemical plants and give them the ability to, to learn how to react to certain situations before they become an uh, issue. In studies, root causes of a lot of crane accidents come with inexperience of the equipment. There, there's a lot of truth in that. People being inexperienced with, with the equipment, lack of knowledge of the machine, its capabilities, proper rigging, site conditions, and lift planning, uh, lack of experience in terms of changing conditions or, or changing loads, and operator complacency. Lack of experience in terms of changing conditions, excellent way to train that is with sims. Because you can go from being sunny, 90 degrees outside, to a front blowing in, changing directions, becoming overcast, and winds blowing 15, 20, 30 miles an hour where they've been calm five minutes earlier. Being here on the Texas Gulf Coast, that is very critical and part of the trainings that I've developed using simulators for a previous employer of mine. Uh, lack of knowledge on the equipment. These simulators, if you if you get these fully immersive sets, even even these desktops, will give you the capabilities to identify proper rigging, crane setup, and, and give you the capabilities to learn those machines in a controlled environment and give you the experience that you need on these these various pieces of equipment. A big hazard in, out there in the field is operating around power lines. You know, we've listed a couple of the OSHA standards here that are very particular to the construction industry and power line safety. Power line safety is, is not something you really want to practice in the field with. You want to be able to know how to control that load and respect those boundaries that are set forth by OSHA and whatever manufacturer or 
company you're working for or training for that you abide by their policies. Overloading the crane. Enough said there. That is a very key problem with new operators or people that are inexperienced with with cranes is not realizing what their tipping axis is or how to react to it when it starts when they start to feel it getting ready to to come over with simulators you're able to, to train for that and it could be not so much as overloading the crane you could have a part of the rigging break that causes shock loading of the crane to throw it into an overload situation and you can train for those scenarios as well critical lifts you can take and put your critical lift information into these machines into these simulators or any simulators out there and and train on those to verify that the people that are going to be making these lifts are qualified number one and that the lift plan is going to work as it is designed to do making sure that the rigging is correct the radiuses are correct ground pressure and all the dynamics that, that go into critical lift planning are being uh, viewed and corrected before you even actually get out into the field because some of these lifts that you're making that are very critical may not be very expensive but it could be lead times on them that uh, could make them become critical and crane dynamics uh, crane dynamics being uh, lighting conditions winds rain fog snow uh, ground conditions these are all items that you can input into a, a scenario in a training program to, to better qualify and train your your operators <clears throat> to maintain maintain control of equipment you have to account for a large number of variables including machine capacity making sure you have the right machine for the the job part of that is being able to simulate that on a simulator given the take a say a 30 ton machine you have set up in your simulator but yet you're going to bring in a, a load that will exceed the capacity of that crane and getting that trainee to be able to recognize does he have the right crane to pick up that piece of equipment verifying that his ground conditions are correct where is he set up to the, in regards to the power lines does he have the control of his load to be able to work near power lines the weather conditions uh, like I say you know weather conditions change on a very very rapid basis uh, so being able to train for those on a sim is, is the best way that I can tell you to do it specialized rigging and operator experience with load control load control is everything when I was a trainer for one of the major oil companies here in Texas uh, we use these simulators to train apprentices and one of the main things that we trained was load control making sure they were able to capture that pendulum effect before we put them on a piece of equipment out in the field so that way they didn't tear the real equipment up or damage equipment out in the field uh, in, a, in a process unit or something or get into power lines for that matter why we use a simulator acquire basic skills and confidence in a safe low stress environment you're sitting in a classroom you've got a piece of equipment you're not controlled by the environment outside you can set up any scenario you want on any type of piece of equipment which you have the information for the simulator on and, and just learn how to run those those machines uh, practice challenging lifts different conditions you know we've been talking about wind and rain you can also get simulators that have signalman stations to where you can have somebody actually giving hand signals or voice commands to 
a operator trainee or operator to where they can make the lift in the blind. Uh, and trained during implement weather or machine maintenance. A lot of these machines that we, we use simulators for or I would, had worked previously weren't even on site. We would bring them, download software into our sims and train our operators on these machines so that way they were competent and qualified before we even built the machine on site. That way we could train them in, in bad weather and, and while the machine was being built out on site as well. One, for, one instructor can provide an engaging training experience with multiple students. We had, a, we had two sims where I worked at and I could work with two different trainees or operators at a time and give them more personalized training than having 15 people standing around one piece of equipment in the field. They feel more relaxed, they're going to be more receptive to what you're, you're telling them and are going to pick up on everything a lot quicker. You're putting less wear and tear on your actual equipment and you're not spending the money on the additional maintenance or fuel costs. And like I say, it reduces the stress levels on students and instructors because they're not so much worried about you tearing up a $250,000 crane in the field by training you ahead of time on a sim in, the, in, a, in a classroom. And you can measure their skills from the very beginning as they progress to where you can track and inform that those people of where their competency levels are and where they need to continue to work in order to make a, a safe operators and knowledgeable op operators. Operators need to be able to perform safely, quickly, and efficiently. The way I always looked at it is quality is better than quantity. The safer you operate, the better you're going to, your times will be as you may start out slow, but it, the safer you are and the more muscle memory you develop and the more confidence you develop in yourself as an operator and in the machine that you're operating, your times do increase. Fast does not always mean unsafe and slow does not necessarily mean safe. I've seen where somebody be operating very slow and overload a machine because they were not paying attention to their dynamics. And by doing this in a, in a controlled environment with a simulator, you can reduce those uh, issues. Operator load control is everything, safety, production, and machine longevity. Uh, as I said, quantity before quality, or quality before quantity, will improve your production, and will, as as you become more confident, you're going to add to the longevity because you're not going to be dynamic uh, of the equipment because you're not going to be doing so much dynamic loading on it. And dynamic loading does not have to be from the very lifting that load off the ground. It can be for when you start to swing and you swing very fast, and then that load has to catch up with you. You're putting uh, dynamics on the crane boom that you shouldn't be placing. Over the course of accidental contact between a load and a stationary object is undesirable. That is why we, the, my previous employer, we had, had developed several scenarios on high critical situations where we were had machines in tight areas where they were training how to make particular lifts in a particular unit as if they were on an actual crane inside that unit. And it will help you to identify where your potential for contact will be and it also helps with a rigor and a signalman because it, they have to signal, we bring them in to signal the crane because these lifts were in the blind uh, as well. So we kind of tied all that together to to help reduce the collisions that could possibly come into effect. Pendulum swings are bad. Uh, 
not necessarily if a trainee can control the pendulum swing, a second or less, they might still have control. You know, you're going to get a little bit of a, a pendulum effect when you go to start the swing, but being able to catch it is, is the name of the game. And in, in a controlled environment with these sims, that is the best way to do it. I, unfortunately, when I was coming through, I had to learn how to catch mine in the field, and I actually learned how to catch a pendulum effect inside of a enclosed turbine. Not very safe. With these simulators, you don't have to worry about that. Bridging the gap. Simulation gives you a safe, controlled, enclosed environment in the classroom. You're, you're able to teach basic mechanics, hone your skills with the simulator. You got your classroom training, which is your theory, tying into the simulator, which is going to be practicing your skills, building your confidence, and learning how to anticipate uh, hazards, and, and tying that into your real life experience on the real equipment. A realistic simulator allows novices to move with from the sim to real machines without having to unlearn and bad habits. Very good point because if you develop bad habits they're a whole lot harder to break than good habits. So if you have a realistic sim and you can train on those and develop the good habits from the very beginning you're not as apt to build those those bad habits reduces your learning curve to where the real machine is less intimidating to somebody uh, who's never been on a crane before. Uh, realistic simulation is key to developing good operator habits before they become even get in a machine or and reducing time to competency. Competency is the name of the game and if you've developed good skills and good habits in on the simulator, those will transfer to the field as well because you're developing that muscle memory that all good crane operators have. Hand-eye coordination, being able to re recognize hazards before they become issues, uh, and being able to correct before you have that, that problem. And you're able to train in situations that aren't able to do uh, practically in the in the real world. And then the end result an operator who is known and is, is a reliable asset. An operator with knowledge and confidence and four attributes of a good operator is they know what to do because they've they've proven their competency. They know the time and control moments how to time and control the movements of the crane in order to uh, control their load, they know their abilities and their limits. Just because you feel that you're, you're qualified or competent on a rough terrain crane does not mean you're qualified on, a, on an all-terrain crane or a crawler crane. Different tonnages, different load dynamics, different boom dynamics, if you, you, you reduce a lot of that uncertainty and improve your abilities and helping people realize their limits with these sims and they can anticipate and react to events before they become issues. One of the key things about being a qualified operator is being able to recognize what's going to happen before it actually becomes an issue and, and operator comp, uh, complacency. We all get that way. We've done this job a hundred times. It's not going to happen to me, but it does. So, you know, simulators help to reduce some of that complacency by keeping mind sharp. And then all that ends equals into safer lifts. And that would be all I would have. Terrific, Carl. Thank you so much. Thank you. Perfect. You got your contact information up there. Okay, I'm going to launch it to our last poll, and then we'll go into some question and answer. Uh, we've got a lot of great questions to go over with you guys. So let me take back the controls here and I will Okay, 
I'm going to launch this third poll. All right. What do you think is the biggest potential benefit of simulation-based training, guys? Okay, a few more seconds. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close this poll here and share the results. And I hope you all can see that. Justin, Carl, what do you think? Well, I agree that really one of the biggest benefits you have on the simulator is being prepared for the unexpected. Uh, the reality is, in the field, there are lots of areas you can train. And you you got to train on the real equipment. you got to taste the dirt to actually learn real skills. But there are some areas that it's just not viable. It's just not within your budget. It's just not safe enough to do in the field. So simulators allow you to do all sorts of things that you just wouldn't do on the, on a real piece of equipment. So uh, I, I agree with the audience here. It really, one of the biggest benefits you get is being prepared for those unexpected situations. And honestly, in the field, those are things that cost lives, that cost money, that cost time. Um, so it's really one of the greatest benefits and why it's a complement to, to a training program and not a replacement of the training program itself. Yeah, I have to agree 100%. Better, better prepared for the unexpected. That is one of the key things with these simulators is that you can throw the unexpected in there from a computer, from the operator or from the instructor station, without the trainee or operator realizing that you're doing this. You can change the wind, you can change the the lighting conditions, you can even break the rigging. Uh, simulate breaking a sling or what have you. So yes, being better prepared for the unexpected, I, I'll agree with 100%. Great. All right, I'm going to go ahead and close this poll here and dive into some question and answer here. Perfect. And here's our contact information. If you have any follow-up questions afterwards, please feel free to contact all, any of us, and uh, we'd be happy to assist you. Um, again, if you do have a question, go ahead and put it in that question box, and we'll get started. We probably have seven or eight that we want to get going on. Um, first of all, are the skills learned on a simulator transferable to a real crane? I know Carl will probably be best to answer that question since he's got real-world experience with this. Yes, they can, and they're very critical to developing your basic skills on that simulator. As I, as I was saying, uh, I used to work for a, a large oil refiner just outside of Houston, and we had a couple simulators, and we developed a couple of custom scenarios that we could train operators on, namely our apprentices on, before they were turned out or qualified to, to actually go run a crane by themselves. So they were actually qualified to do these lifts in, clo in closed situations, uh, in very tight quarters, in the, that were at very tight quarters in the field prior to even going out there. They knew how to set the crane up, where to set the crane up, and what parameters that crane needed to be set up in before they even saw this job the very first time that they went out there to make this lift. So yes, you can take those skills that you learn on the simulator and transfer them into real-world situations. Super. And what percentage of the training time can you replace on a real crane by using a simulator? Do you have any idea? 
we use we use the simulators quite a bit for our apprentices. And uh, several years ago, we were bringing in some some big crawler cranes that a lot of our in-house journeyman operators were not uh, familiar with, and got with uh, the manufacturer of our sims and had them build us some low charts and the materials for those particular cranes, and we trained them on that. So it, it depends. We did a, a lot of simulation training with our apprentices, getting them ready for the, the field and tying that into their on-the-field training with their, their mentors, as, as we called them, in the field uh, they had, to where they had a very basic knowledge of what the crane was going to do before they got out there. So we probably did about 60 or 70 percent with our apprentices, and we probably did about a good 15 or 20 percent with uh, journeyman operators as well, training them on new equipment and keeping them their skills up on equipment that they didn't normally run on a daily basis. Okay. Now this is in relation to older operators with ex you know experienced operators. Um, how was simulator-based training received by older experienced operators in your company, and how long did it take for them to familiarize uh, to the simulator? It really didn't take them that long to familiarize with the, the simulator because the simulators we had were very immersive, and uh, it was just like sitting down in the actual cab of whatever crane we had them sitting in. You know, we were training them on, and they were very receptive. You know, as, as I was saying, you know, they were very receptive, especially when we were bringing in these cranes that were unfamiliar to them, and we were able to get them trained into how to set their their computer systems up uh, to where the crane they could operate the crane even before the crane even got on site. So they were very receptive and glad to have that flexibility that instead of learning on the fly and tearing up a piece of equipment. Perfect. We have one um, more question about training that I'll direct at Carl and then we've got some CM Labs questions after that too. Um, one of our attendees made the comment that a very important point today is that we can train the operators on a in a collaborative environment. Is it possible to train as a team with simulators? It is very valuable to train as simulators. As I was explaining earlier, you know, with one of these custom scenarios, we would bring in riggers and signal burn to train as well with these crane operators because they got to work hand in hand, and especially if you're working in the blind. And we would bring them in and set them in a separate room, use a walkie-talkie or a radio, whatever the case may be, to flag the crane as if it was in the blind. You know, we just put blinders on our operator to where he couldn't see what the screen. You know, it, all he could see was the screen. He couldn't see where he was going into, and that op that signalman had to signal that crane into there and make that lift. And that was part of what we were doing with uh, these custom scenarios because they were blind lifts that required more than one person to, to make it, you know. It, it was very beneficial in, in teaching as a team uh, with simulators. Okay, great. Justin, uh Earlier in your slides, uh, you presented some data on the use of simulations in the medical um, transportation industries, heavy equipment. Where did you get that data? It's from a, a magazine online called the Chief Learning Officer Magazine. So you can go to their website and you have access to all their articles. The published date of this one is actually June 2007. Um, so you know, a lot of the data around simulators has been around for a long time. So feel free to go over there. The information is available there. And quite frankly, online, there's lots of newer information about the usage of simulators and, and how they translate to either cost savings or efficiency. Great. Now, about the simulators, uh, does the platform allow real-time introduction of unsafe conditions, or is it all pre-planned according to a set program that is being run? 
They can be introduced at any time by the operator, uh, the instructor. Basically, the instructor has a console that he can operate himself. This console let him lets him kind of overview what the student is doing. So you have kind of a bird's eye view of the uh, operational scenario. And at any point in time, you see the inputs that they're doing to the joystick, to the pedals. You can decide, you know what, I'm going to make a brake failure, or I'm going to make this cable snap or I am going to add a gust of wind. So you can actually, in real time while the student is doing the operation, uh, inject these malfunctions, these faults or the environment variables. So the instructor is in full control as to when he wants those things to happen. It's also possible to script these things, but to give the instructor the ability to inject it at any time adds even more value because it keeps the operation and the training exercises dynamic. The student needs to stay on his toes because he never knows what to expect. Great. And finally, our last question here, unless there's another one that comes through, um, can you set up simulators to be crane and model specific? Absolutely. Um, so when it comes to um, the off-the-shelf products, for instance, that we offer, we have a, a certain number of crane types of equipment types as well for earth moving in ports. And it, Many clients, I would say perhaps 40% of the clients that come into us, come in with special requirements. Those special requirements could be a specific crane, a specific scenario, uh, specific examinations or metrics that they want to record. And we take those requirements and propose a custom solution where we're not rebuilding and reinventing the whole simulator, but we're replacing one of those content components. For instance, uh, you come in, you have your specific version of your mobile crane you want represented. We will basically find the cost of developing the 3D models to visualize your crane, the dynamics to actually run the behavior of the crane, the loading and the rigging, and we will incorporate that into our off-the-shelf solutions in order to give a cost-effective but custom solution that fits a need. So absolutely, customizations are available, and quite frankly, they are required in a lot of cases where you have very specific training objectives. Great. Okay. Um, okay, we did have one more question come, to, come through. Uh, can side boom, sorry, I lost just a second. Too many things on the screen here. Um, can side boom used in the pipeline industry be simulated by your setup? And another one about crane operations is that how hard is it to add a two crane lift or tandem lift to the crane simulators? Well, on the side boom question, I will admit we've reached the level of my proficiency since my focus is mostly defense. So I would invite the person that sent that question to come visit our website at www.cm-labs.com. Uh, there's a request page. Send in your information and we'll get the right people, the, uh, the people with the crane knowledge and also knowledge of developing these simulators to respond to that question accurately. So I'm sorry I can't respond on the phone right now. But we have a great team of engineers here that are ready and willing to answer those questions for you. And would you okay. repeat that same last goes, uh, question, Katie? Sorry, uh, same goes for tandem lifts or two crane lifts to uh, crane simulators. Is that a possibility? Absolutely, is a, it is a possibility. Um, whether it's a tandem lift between two of the same cranes, two different cranes, uh, modeling different types of loads that are very heavy or off balance or have a very odd center of mass or rigging attachments, all of that is possible and addressable with the simulator. So the reality is we sell a simulator as a standalone training solution. But as you expand your training program, you could buy additional modules for different types of equipment to run on that simulator. You could buy second simulators to communicate with those and to run simulator, uh, sorry, um, exercises together as well. There's no limitation on how you want these uh, simulators to work together. Of course, there's some customization that may be involved, but that needs to be dealt on a case-per-case -case basis. So coming to us with, or any simulator provider, with a very clear set of requirements, and by requirements I mean what is your end objective, you can really find something that fits your needs um, in terms of tandem lifts or uh, working a full job site with multiple pieces of equipment, working different roles, but having to operate within a confined space. Everything is possible. There's no limitations to that today. 
Okay, and did you mention you can network with the simulators um, with other simulators that are not in the same location? Absolutely, that can be done, but it also presents certain challenges. Um, and this is something that uh, the defense industry deals with on a daily basis, uh, where they have remote churning sites across the country, and they need to do war games that basically communi com communicate this between them. I will be very honest, it has a high cost to it, and you need to have certain levels of uh, standardization of the network protocol, the speed of the internet provided. There are a lot of dependencies that make for really realistic shared training at different locations. So yes, it is possible, but uh, there's an attached cost to that. Um, having network simulators at the same location is a lot easier to address. So the answer is yes, both are possible, but um, they, uh, they have an associated cost uh, based on the complexity and also on the infrastructure that you have in place to support that type of networking as well. Super. All right, this seems to be the, la the very last question, and it kind of goes back to the types of crane, um, it's not just mobile cranes, right? You offer tower crane operator training, correct? There is two also, Absolutely. Right? Uh, mobile crane, tower cranes, crawler cranes. Uh, uh, really, uh, we, we've done uh, cranes mounted on ships, cranes mounted on trains. There's no limitation to the type of cranes that are supported and the complex rigging as well. We've done really customized cranes too, very large cranes that are done for windmill erection, uh, uh, offshore uh, engineering erection as well. So there's, quite frankly, a large library of off-the-shelf products, but no limitations as to any custom crane custom product that you need right there. Everything that lifts a piece of equipment, we can support. Super. Well, it looks like those are all the questions we have today. Uh, again, our contact information is up here on the screen. And I had a person say that maybe the website isn't working for Carl. Um, so it's we'll not. follow up with, with that correct information afterwards. My apologies on that. Um, we'll get you the information uh, once, once I figure that out. And then uh, thank you all for attending. Have a great Friday. If you have um, any comments, suggestions, please feel free to email me. And with that said, um, thanks again for attending.